morning. <laughs> Hello, good morning, Dr. Jan Hoffmann. Welcome to this course. Welcome to the MCA. Great that you are with us today. And we're looking very much forward to hear your talk about uh, the review of maritime transport 2023. And uh, I think it's um, a very interesting presentation. We are very much looking forward. Great that you are with us today. Please. Good. Yeah, very happy to be with you. Um, it's an online world these days. Uh, so it's good to be able to do this from here, from Geneva, from my home office. I speak mostly about the review of Maritime Transport 2023. It's a publication we have been producing since 1968. Uh, very proud of it, um, and yeah, let's let's start a little bit. Um, oh, I hope this would work. Yeah, there's have my little clicker here. Um, so Dan, that's a photo. May I, may I come back to you? Yeah. you? You presented us a very very nice uh, sheet uh, of your CV of your bio. Yeah, and uh, it was a little bit for me a great career, Jan. Mm. Uh, and it, it 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 was touching. I remember that we went uh, with a group of students mm. uh, to your office. You invited us, and there we saw a very nice picture. Mm. Uh, you are saying for eight years, uh, Jan also worked uh, part time. Uh, sorry, mm. um, yeah, worked part time for the family tramp shipping business Hoffmann Shipping, based in Horneburg, Germany with a twin decker registered in St. John's, Antigua and Barbuda. That was really touching for me. We all saw this picture of this nice ship. There it is. This tells me that you are not only involved in this maritime transport business from a theoretical perspective, but you are involved with your heart. Huh? I think there are hardly officials who are running a business <laughs> like you do mm. with these uh, yeah. very nice uh, ship. Uh, to me, it was really touching. Huh? Yeah. Right. No, no, thanks. And in fact, that was like by way of introduction. I here on the, what you see on the screen on is this twin decker on which I, I once upon a time worked as a seafarer. The owner and captain was my father. Uh, I introduced this, and and as you said, okay, to introduce myself, I. Um, why I did this while I was studying economics in Hamburg. Afterwards, I went and worked for the IMO in London in 1995-96. I worked for the International Maritime Organization. Uh, from there, I moved from London, I moved to Chile, where I worked for the UN Regional Commission, ECLAC. So for seven years, I was in Chile and uh, traveled most, practically all countries of Latin America, Caribbean, looking at port reforms, coastal shipping, hub ports, this type of thing. And now I'm already 20 years with UNCTAD, and I also tell you a little bit about what UNCTAD does before we then go into the substance. So yeah, thank you, Frank. That's by the way of introduction, a bit of the personal history, the and institution. Jan, and, uh, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> uh, I, I saw another sentence, the last one uh, yeah. you showed us here. It's it's really interesting. Uh, there we read, <laughs> Dr. Hoffman <laughs> has been to 130 countries and had his hair cut in 78. Uh, right, right, yeah. Like then I sent you this uh, CV. Abroad, yeah. But yeah. this haircut, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course, a physical phenomenon, but also in another, in a theoretical sense, um, did you receive a haircut in your uh, professional experience? Yeah, that is something I, I can later on. I put the link in the okay, chat okay. to my empirical <laughs> study. Um, so in fact, uh, we had planned this lecture quite some time ago. Uh, by now it is 80 haircut countries. So I'm preparing my book about uh, like Jules Verne around the world in 80 days, no, around the world in 80 haircut countries. And, and it is interesting, you see, and I sent you the link, this empirical study about gut and guts. Gut is general agreement on tariffs and trade. Guts is trade and services. So in order to export a service such as shipping, or haircuts, you actually need to import goods. So you see in my empirical study, where I then I travel, I've just, uh, this haircut here I think is from Morocco. The previous one was from 
Jeddah. And so you, you go and see where do the hairdressers actually come from, the, the people who cut the hair. In the poorer countries, they tend to be locals, but the machinery and the shampoo and the scissors is imported. When I went to my hairdresser in Austria, uh, the lady who cut my hair was from um, Laos, like Laos, from, from Southeast Asia. But then the machinery and so on was made, made in Europe. And, and the very, very exotic places like Marshall Islands there, everything is imported. Even the hairdresser there came from the Philippines. No? So that is, it is true. And, and thanks for bringing this up. I didn't want to speak too much about myself, but maybe it's, it helps to put the substance in the context. So I've worked for the shipping company. And when I travel for my work, uh, I try not to stay only in the hotel room or the ministry office or whatever, but actually go out and yeah, experience life. So coming back to the shipping life. So this true story actually, continuing by way of introduction, this was Hoffman shipping. My, the owner was my father. We used the flag, we registered the ship in Antigua and Barbuda. The freight agent was from the Netherlands and Amsterdam. The seafarers were Polish. The crewing agent was in Cyprus, Navigo management. We would ship cargo, for example, from Turkey to Canada, get fuel in Algeciras, have it insured in a P&I club in the UK, and had it repaired, say, in a shipyard in Portugal. So that's how many countries, ladies and gentlemen, are involved in Hoffman shipping. As I see you on my right screen, I can ask interactively. Anybody very quickly unmute and give a number. How many countries in Hoffman shipping? Depends how you count, but 10? Yeah, 10. Um, I think that's, that's what most people would say. Now I give you some further background information. Captain's favorite drink was from Ireland. So it was actually 11 countries. Yeah. So this is probably the one thing you will remember in 10 years from now when you look about think about this lecture i will give you a lot of statistics and numbers and economics but hoffman shipping and the international production of maritime transport that's one of the key messages what do we do in anktat we like to say we think we debate we deliver uh, thinking is research like the review of my time transfer, we produce public goods, we produce a line of shipping connectivity index, statistics, data sets on transport costs, country profiles. And this then helps us with the conference part, because UNCTAD stands for United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. That's actually how it started. It started with the conference where now we have commissions, we have regional work, we have we support other multilateral processes at the World Trade Organization, at the International Maritime Organization. But it started in 1963, 64, 1964, UNCTAD was created, uh, the Review of Maritime Transport since 1968. So the conference actually was just a conference where countries got together to improve trade, a bit like what WTO is doing these days. And then the member states said, okay, dear colleagues, the secretariat who prepared the conference, for the next conference, please help us with some background research and studies and documents. So we started with research. And then the member states, including Germany, including all Philippines, China, everybody, they all then said, okay, dear Angtat Secretary, please also help us to implement what we agreed on. So we, in my areas, we work on projects on sustainable freight transport, trade station, customs automation, climate change adaptation, and so on. So that's a bit about us by way of introduction. Uh, now let us go to the uh, um, substance, the, the issues, the, what's happening in ports and shipping. Um, but again, I will step one step back. I will tell you a few things that go be, come before this year's review of maritime transport, like the story so far. Now imagine um, you watch a James Bond movie and when you first have like 10 minutes pre-story and then finally comes actually the when the movie starts. So, so a, little, a bit of pre-story, what, what happened over the last, the long-term trends. Um, this data here is actually from the United States, but it's a global trend. In the United States, in 1980, the economy would spend more on inventory holding than on transport. 
inventory holding, meaning you pay for the warehouse, but more importantly, you have capital costs, depreciation costs, insurance costs, uh, while you, you store the things within logistics and transport <laughs> is moving things. So this for me is a very positive long-term trend. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, one coffee. It's positive. And this does not mean that transport has become more expensive. Like the very long-term transport has not become more expensive in terms of energy efficiency and, and so on. But transport has and trade facilitation and customs, also your area, has become more efficient, which is why I spend more on transport and less on waiting and storing and inventory holding. So today, uh, the US economy spends twice as much on transport than on inventory holding. Um, another long-term trend, the typical distance traveled in international shipping. And this has been going up, not, not extremely, but year after year, long-term trend. The, you have more iron ore going from Brazil to Asia than to Europe. You have more LNG from Trinidad going to Japan than to the US. And all this makes the distance traveled going up. It is, in my personal view, also a positive development in the sense that we have uh, yeah, more everybody trading with everybody longer distances. The third long-term trend is the participation of developing countries. And this is really a, a totally different geography of trade. When I went to school, I learned that the rich countries were the ones uh, generating jobs in manufactured goods. And they were like Germany was importing iron or coal oil from the poorer countries and was exporting manufactured goods to the poorer countries. So here we have the share of developing countries in tons, uh, important, not value. So in tons in 1970, the developing countries exported much more than they imported. The red bar, the loaded, this is the exports, it's seaborne trade statistics. So you see far more volume was exported by the developing countries as a group than the share of what they imported. But the, I repeat, this is a volume in terms of volume, the imported cars and dishwashers and uh, uh, air conditioning system, what have you, manufactured goods were actually of more value. Huh? But And today, um, developing countries and there's one big important player here among the so-called developing countries. If you divide the world into two, it's China. But it's not only China, but also Vietnam, Thailand, South Africa, Costa Rica. They are all more and more also participating in globalized production and also importing raw materials, energy, coal, oil, iron ore, and then also continue to, to export. So the red bar is the exports and the blue. The import. I think this is a, this is never the news. This is year after year after year, you have a little change, but so I'm giving you the big long-term picture of a changed geography of trade. So that was the long-term. And then came COVID, the supply chain crisis. We saw freight rates going through the roof. The red line here is the container shipping freight rates, what you pay to average to move a container. It went up fivefold. The blue line is what the shipping lines, the MERS, the Hapag Lloyd, the MSCs of this world, what they pay to lease a container ship. Because although it may say MSC or Hapag Lloyd on the side, half of these ships are not owned by the shipping companies. They are owned by some German dentist uh, found, uh, investment fund or by some Greeks or Italians. So, so the, these container charter rates actually went up even more. So, and when this happened, we were all asking ourselves now, what does this mean for these long-term trends? What does this mean for globalized production, for logistics, and so on? So what happened? And here, uh, I understand most of you are not economists, but I will give you a very, very, very basic 101 introduction, maritime economics. Demand for 
our shipping services is what we call very inelastic. I could make this blue line even steeper, actually. Um, even if the freight rate changes a lot, the volume, the demand changes very little. Because when you and I buy a laptop, a camera, a Barbie doll, whatever, in the shop, um, the international shipping is only a small part of the final price. So even if now the freight rate goes up fivefold, sevenfold, the what you are willing to pay for your iPhone for Christmas does not change much. I mean, it may I come to this, but so that's demand in shipping. It's very inelastic. The supply in shipping looks like this. In, if you look look to a normal microeconomics uh, textbook you will have demand supply curves that look like lines. But in shipping, you very much have this type of line, at least in the short term. When there's enough capacity, you are at the left at the bottom and freight rates can be very low and do not change a lot. But the moment you reach a capacity limit, to build a new ship takes three, four years between ordering and so on. You cannot increase short-term Capacity, you may, can try and go faster, but you cannot go much faster. Uh, ships are then little idle capacity normally. So the normal starting point long term is this point. Now, what happened during COVID and what I will share with you is the best presentation you have ever seen about what happened to shipping during the COVID crisis. Two things happened. First, Joe Biden and European Central Bank and others printed money. And you and I stayed at home and ordered more things. My wife ordered a bicycle to, to bicycle at home, the, the standing things. Uh, I ordered a bigger screen, the one I'm looking at right now, and, and furniture. So many of these things went up. By the way, one parenthesis here. Uh, there's... There are a few things where the order would went down, where, where fewer things were purchased. Um, the one thing that had the biggest decline, not what you see, but the biggest decline in order during COVID were men's clothes, parenthesis. But most things went up in demand. What happened on the supply side? Um, ships were in the wrong place, you had congestion, dock workers were sick, whatever. Ships spent 20% longer in port than before, which effectively means a reduction of capacity. The supply curve went to the left. And here you have this green increase. And in fact, in reality, it was even more, it was fivefold. Huh? So this is just by illustration, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the best presentation you have seen about what happened in shipping during COVID. Now, what does this mean? And this here is actually from the review of maritime transport before the, um, yeah, I think I will go come back to that, but never mind. So at a time when Paul Krugman and others still said, don't worry about inflation. A bit more than two years ago, we did this. Um, yeah, two and a half years ago, we, we did this. Um, we said, if the container freight rates really go up that much, long term, it will lead to higher prices. So I just told you that shipping is only a small part in the final price, but it is not zero. So we simulated and forecasted that consumer prices will go up by 1.5 percentage points um, when nobody saw any inflation, any increase. And six months later, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, saw there was inflation and calculated what are the causes of inflation. And they said 1.5% are due to higher shipping costs. And they quoted us as having predicted this correctly. Um, to the right, you have some acronyms. 
you may know that LDC stands for least developed country and SITS stands for small island developing states. So if you live in Kiribati or Comoros or Fiji, and you depend a lot on shipping, or you already pay twice as much for Mari for international transport than Germany pays. And now shipping freights go up, then your consumer prices, they went up even more, 7.58%. And this is just an average. There were families, communities, islands, where prices went up 10, 20%. And if you are already very, very poor and you, you have not much to eat, and this really is a reduction of your real income by another 20%, increasing poverty. So it did make a difference. Which type of products were mostly affected? And I found this also very interesting. <laughs> Here I, I picked the ones, the average was plus 1.5%, uh, but some were product types were even more. The one that says furniture, other manufacturing, these are cheap products. Imagine a container full of white plastic garden furniture, you know, this cheap furniture. There, the content of a container may be valued just $10,000, $20,000. And if the freight rate goes up from $1,000 to $5,000 or from $2,000 to $10,000, it does have an impact on the price. So instead of buying cheap garden furniture made in Southeast Asia, Europe started making some of these closer to home, make them in Slack, Czech Republic or so. The first one here, computer electronics, optical products, that is the interesting one. <laughs> because you think, well, this is high value. A, a container full of Nikon cameras or, or expensive medical equipment. It, the content is val worth a million. Doesn't matter if the freight rate is 5,000 or 20,000. Correct. But before these expensive things are put into the container in Shanghai, the bits and pieces have been moved several times. There are, are so-called deep supply chains. Up to nine times the bits and pieces that go into the camera have been shipped from Thailand to Korea, from Korea to Costa Rica, from Costa Rica to where. So it accumulates and also has this impact on prices. Now we are back. Updated just for you, just last week. <laughs> Uh, latest freight rates, container charter rates, they're really back to pre-COVID. Uh, the Just now was in the news, they, they are now back to lowest level since 2016. So, so you see it here. Um, now, what happened to my dear long-term trends? Actually, during COVID, the share of expenditure on inventory holding went up. The very latest, this is done by a friend of mine, Jean-Paul Rodriguez, uh, it is still, this coefficient is still going up, uh, even 2022. So it's a bit yeah, worrying. I personally do think, I expect, I hope, that we will come back to the long-term trend. So this black line should go back to downwards where you'll come back to this. We, because we have seen the, um, we have seen the, the improvement in, in technology and in trade facilitation, custom automation. What about this trend, the distance? Actually, during COVID, we saw some, what we call near shoring, not sure. But the next one is it's going up again the distance and we'll come back to this and the last trend actually for the first time ever the group of countries that were so-called developing countries in 1970 saw their share of imports slightly decrease for the first time since we looked at it but the very latest data is again what i would call the positive trend a continued growing share of developing countries that was my james bond uh introduction <laughs> um, and now we start with my presentation <laughs> <laughs> good review my time transport i'm not going by chapter by chapter i will go through like three main themes and then a bit of an outlook the ma main theme that was mostly in the special chapter and highlighted was the energy transition 
Then I will look at demand supply markets, economics, look at ports, maritime connectivity, trade station customs comes in there. I will go back a little bit to the energy transition, what these, what we have learned means, and then go challenges, opportunities. Let's start with the energy transition, decarbonization and shipping. We were actually surprised that many of our readers, counterparts, journalists were surprised when we shared, when we published this chart. Emissions from shipping have continued to go up by about 20% over the last 10 years. While they should have been going down and they should go down in future. On the positive side, the emissions per ton of cargo and per ton mile have been going down, especially in container, because trade has growing has been growing faster than the um, the emissions and ton miles the distance even more. So that's good news. But sorry, sorry to spoil the good news. This is from last year's review. There we already looked at this data. On the left, you can see how smaller ships emit more CO2 per container than bigger ships. And as ships have been become bigger on average and maximum sizes, about half of the improvement in the CO2 emission intensity is due to economies of scale, not any improvement in technologies or the use of alternative fuels. So, Demand, supply, and markets. We'll come back to implicate, but I wanted to, this is a starting point. This was a special chapter, and I want to discuss this, but first, some other lessons learned, what, what we have seen. This was the, uh, a bit of, like, for you, introduction, what is actually being moved in terms of tons. Dry bulk continues to be the biggest volume in shipping. Um, oil used to be the biggest. When we started in 1968, oil was more than half of seaborne trade. Huh? But now you see the, the lila, the, the pink, whatever color. You know, uh, men see fewer colors than women, so I don't know what color that is. But anyhow, so the second one, the oil one. <laughs> um, so, but dry bag is the biggest, followed by oil. And the third one now is containers, while general cargo others uh, have decreased their share. Um, if I put all this together, of course, the tons growth year by year and the ton miles, how far it's carried, they go largely parallel. But if you look in detail, most of the last years, you see that the ton miles have grown a bit more than the tons. And that means that the average distance traveled has also gone up. And this is interesting. This is important also for here, politics enters the, this chart. Um, there is some long-term trend, but especially the in oil and grain, you see the impact of the war in Ukraine. If up to recently, the Egypt would buy grains from Ukraine, now they have to buy it from further away, from US and Brazil, or at least a larger part. If in the past Russian oil went to Europe and now it goes to India and China, it goes a longer distance. And this increase in demand in ton miles has a double in effect. So we looked at food prices, that what the poor people in, in, in Djibouti or Egypt, and they have to pay more now for the imported um, grain, no, the, the uh, Weizen, uh, what is it? Uh, Wheat. wheat, yeah, thanks. Wheat, <laughs> trigo in Spanish. So, um, maize or corn, whatever. So, the price, the world market price of the raw material goes up because there's less of it. Good. Or not good. Um, in addition, I have to transport it over longer distance. So, I have to pay more days of chartering ships. And on top of this, the price of chartering a ship per day has also gone up because you remember the supply curve that I showed you, you cannot build new ships. So, so the price per ship per day has also gone up. And this has implications, this these economics. If I come back later on 
and we discussed the energy transition, the need for new and different ships. Do you allow a question, Dr. Hoffman? Yes, please, please, come in. Jump Sorry, in. I, I was just uh, on that, that previous slide. I, I was wondering if you are, if you also see uh, uh, cost factors that, for instance, are coming up in, in global shipping due to piracy activities increasing, uh, particularly uh, early in the 2020s, um, uh, and then um, um, political instability like in the Gulf of Aden um, or like from strategic sourcing uh, discussions that we now have. If that yeah. plays in, or if those are minor factors, um, are compared to to the better global uh, global ones that you uh, that you have trended here. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think the the basics of what explains a freight rate today is really demand supply balance. Uh, if you need twenty ships at this moment to get iron ore from Brazil to China, but you only have nineteen then the freight rates increase quite a lot. But where your points come in is, um, and it's one of my three main conclusions, actually, the, we need to reduce uncertainty and risk. <laughs> and political uncertainty like trade wars, real wars, military wars, uh, piracy, all these do play a role there. So if you have a specific hotspot piracy at this moment. Yes, this will increase the, the war insurance premium on that route. It may make a few ships choose a different route. So there is some impact. But for me, the bigger long-term impact of all this uncertainty, including the uncertainty of future, um, the energy transition, where we don't know exactly, I'll come back to this, so that there's, investors are waiting. So what you are saying for me is relevant that it makes investors wait, which means new and the right ships will take longer to be built. And this leads to this shift of the supply curve to the left and has the bigger longer term impact on freight rates. That would be my thinking. Thank you. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so we, we continue here. So this, this order book, so that links actually to also my answer. Uh, here we have the world order book. And well, it doesn't look that dramatic. Actually, we should have done this, not the blue bars, not dead weight tons, but we should have put it in percent of the existing fleet. And in that, it's even less. So it is really, we have a very low order book at present. And if we see at the future demands, we will need more ships, new ships, the distance is going up, The the we need new fuels, this is worrying not to have a bigger order book and not to have an order book for the right ships. Um, let us move also to a bit your topic where it will enter the trade station customs. Yours, you cannot do a lot about demand supply and shipping markets and distances, but you and us at Anktad, we can do something when we work with the ports. We look at port performance, port management, trade facilitation in ports, hinterland, intermodal, and, and so on. No? Um, by way of introduction for, for you, which ship types actually spend more time in port? The dry bulk carriers, the iron ore, coal, grain, they tend to have the slowest handling no, you have low value goods. It doesn't matter so much, uh, uh, and it takes time. Uh, you especially unloading. Uh, you have certain. You really have to grab all the stuff, put it on some conveyor belt. So that takes longer. The the green line here, the dry bulk, the brake bulk, the general cargo also takes long. Then liquid bulk, uh, you you have huge volumes oil. It's not that valuable normally per ton of cargo. And, and the fastest one tends to be container ships. So container ships tend to spend less time in port than the other types um, because it's, yeah, this containerized loading, unloading, it's high value, it has to be fast, it's time sensitive. But also when a container ship goes to a port, as you know, it only unloads, loads a part of the cargo. Uh, rarely is an entire container ship fully emptied. So a container ship between Shanghai and Hamburg stops in six, seven ports and loads, unloads a sixth or seventh of, of the cargo. 
while the others normally load unload everything that also explains the differences so some basic shipping economics here um, now the interesting part here is how the red line the one at the bottom container ships how it actually increased quite significantly no what i said early like 20 percent longer in port on average and this reduced the real capacity during covid and now we are slowly getting back to, to improved port performance for all ship types. Uh, let's focus on the container ships. Um, and I'm actually just back from, uh, would you guess where this photo is taken? You, It's also the, on the cover of the Reef and Maritime Transport, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and Saudi Arabia was very interested in the liner shipping connectivity in of Ankta. So my dear LSCI, is included in the king's royal decree of what the port authority of Saudi Arabia has to achieve by 2030. They have to improve the Anktat LSCI. If you look at uh, Saudi Arabia, the yellow line, actually they have seen quite some improvement. I've put here in big red just for you just now this morning when uh, Frank woke me up and said, Jan, uh, do you remember? <laughs> so I said, oh yeah, let me put this chart. Uh, Germany, latest number, actually not so good. And and maybe at the end, let's see how much time we have. And I'm talking a bit too much, but what, what explains those things for Germany, maybe we can discuss, or for your country, for other countries. So this liner shipping connectivity index, it um, looks at how well a country is connected to the global shipping network. It is put produced with six components, hard data, no opinion, no perception index, nothing. How many ships, how many companies, how many services, size of the biggest ship, total carrying capacity, and how many direct connections. So these are the six components for this index where the world average for most and most countries are improving. And Germany has actually not seen too positive development. Uh, looking at some of the components, um, some have gone up, like ship size. You see the orange line here. And the other side of the same coin is a long-term trend towards mergers and acquisitions, like Maersk purchased Hamburg Süd. And there you have me traveling the world, preaching free markets, and it doesn't matter whether your company that transports your goods is foreign or national and so on, but I confess when uh, when Hamburg Süd was sold and when I afterwards learned they will even paint those ships now in blue and no longer in red, it made me a bit sad. Huh? It was old from Hamburg, original. My father used to work for Hamburg Süd before he bought his own twin decker. And anyhow, that's what it is. The blue line tends to go up. There has been now a surge and increase again, the number of companies per country providing services from it to the average country. Let's, let's see how this continues. Um, looking at different regions of this, uh, the number of operators, especially in Asia, that more different companies provide services to the average country, while um, Northern America, Europe, other regions, it really has, has gone down and continues to decrease. Um, number of active container ports, again here by region Asia, growing, more and more ports are included in the global network, while other regions over the last few years, the ports have actually been taken out of the network, like they're no longer included in the, yeah, in the port calls of the liner shipping companies. Um, now, the performance in those ports, again, I have different regions here, also because you come from different regions. This is an index developed by the World Bank, together with data from Standard and Poor. Uh, we have also the same raw data, but we, we look at it on the country level. Interestingly, the best ports here are in Asia and the worst, according to this index, are in North America. And you can imagine how Los Angeles, Vancouver are not happy about this. When I look at my watch. I could tell you some anecdotes, some stories. Um, what explains those differences? It has to do with the type of cargo, type of operation. North America has mostly imports. 
while Avia has a lot of transshipment. Transshipment tends to be faster, while imports, also compared to exports, are the slowest. You have to have more customs, it takes longer. Then also in many Northern American ports, uh, they do not work uh, 7, 24 seven. They have strong trade unions, different explanations <laughs> for these differences. But one thing we want to look at is what has it to do with development? How can we help developing countries? What can we recommend? And here an even simpler picture, not by region, but by just two regions, developed and developing. On average, the long term, the developed countries are more efficient than the developing countries. The time in port for container ships, the orange line long term has been lower than the blue line, the developing countries, the poorer countries. They have less infrastructure, less human training, IT, and so on. During COVID, it was especially in the developed countries that we saw the surge, the congestion. And in a couple of occasions, actually, the, the waiting time in the developed countries during COVID was higher than the developing countries. I find this very interesting chart. And when we then start looking what explains this congestion waiting time trade station. Now, this is in a quite important chart for, for you, customs part. You are all aware of the WTO trade station agreement. So maybe we will have time to discuss this a bit later on. So we looked at correlation between which countries have implemented or notified to the WTO that they have implemented Article 7.2 of the TFA on electronic payment, Article 7.4 on risk management, authorized operators, border agency cooperation. And we see that those who have implemented it have on average better port performance. Now, important point here, all those people who confuse correlation and causality they will eventually die. But still, I do think that there is actually some causality here. But it may also be that simply poorer countries are bad at both. But we, we found these four measures were the ones with the strongest correlation. And if you want to improve your port performance, maybe those are the four measures you want to focus on to also implement them. Which leads me to some further thinking, uh, I, I added this. So some of this is now a bit beyond the review of time transport, but I thought customs, trade facilitation, IT. So let's think about some developments in trade facilitation and what happened with with um, digital with yeah yeah digital solutions. First, the supply chain crisis really motivated, encouraged a lot of solutions, and secondly. We have amazingly more and more solutions. It's it's. I love this topic of AI. I show you some thoughts. So one way I like to look at it: there are three stages of digitalization. You have optimization, extension, and transformation. Optimization, for example, port call optimization. It's not really a trade facilitation issue. It's more an operational thing. It's about communication, but. So port call optimization is about optimizing the speed, draft, port stay, leading to lower costs, clean environment, more reliability, and so on. That's from the port call optimization task force. In a nutshell, it means the ships should not speed up to arrive too early, but should go at the optimal speed and arrive exactly when you need them. Good old Captain Hoffman, my dear father, he loved to speed full speed with his little tween decker. Um, we had... Uh, um, Volkswagen Golf uh, on the ship. And so my father would arrive as soon as possible and discover, but then went to see Niagara Falls and whatever. Uh, because, of course, the fuel was paid for by the charter and the captain had to decide to go fast for navigation and safety reasons. <clears throat> Anyhow, nowadays that's no longer possible. Uh, you better have port call optimization. Then you have new businesses, extension, a lot of ideas. This actually was from a workshop in Hamburg, quite interesting about new businesses coming out of digitalization. And you have transformation. 
And here I'm proud to say this slide I produced already five years ago. So this thinking here I started putting together five years ago, <laughs> end of 2018. Um, when I started reading all these books, and I that was before ChatGPT, but I somehow thought this is going to be big. And the last book I just read is the one at the top right, uh, top at the bottom right, The Coming Wave. Highly recommended. Huh? This is huge. This whole thing is huge. <laughs> There's a lot of implication. What are the implications? What is the impact of artificial intelligence on the future of international transport and logistics? So here, after a lot of thinking, research, whatever, I put seven key areas where AI can transform the industry. And when I prepared this just for you, I somehow thought, let's let me do this in German. So apologies uh, for afterwards, you, you take Google Translate, you translate it back, but it's really about optimization of routes and planning. Thanks to AI, KIs, Künstliche Intelligenz, Algorithmen, können riesige Datenmengen analysieren und so weiter. Second, um, autonomous vehicles, drones. By the way, all photos are from Hoffman's travels. Huh? So here I was almost hit by another car in Guatemala. Uh, just to illustrate the, the message here. So autonomous uh, vehicles, drones are facilitated by AI. Number three, forecasts are tremendously facilitated by AI. Fourth, um, customs. Oh, that's that's you know the the whole in risk management the whole classification many many things can be improved by applying ai solutions number five smart ports we have a very nice project there actually smart and sustainable ports it's about again it's about optimizing within the system robotic systems number six um transparency um this photo has nothing to do with transport, but I just liked it for transparency. This guy in Vietnam is trying to get an overview about connectivity. Anyhow, AI improves transparency. See the big picture. Seventh, uh, safety, security. Um, lots of things can, can be improved there with, with risk. So these are running through, looking at my watch to allow a bit more for discussion. But, but one last thing, AI can also help me with my PowerPoints because what I just shared with you is just what ChatGPT told me when I asked ChatGPT, what is the impact of AI on logistics? Sorry, I cheated. <laughs> <laughs> and when I said, okay, now uh, what, what about German? Yeah, natürlich. Here is the same Antwort auf Deutsch. That's ChatGPT. So all the text you just saw is not my text. No research, nothing behind. Just me typing a question to ChatGPT. But I think it's illustrative as an example of the power of AI. Yeah, and I would not have shared these points if I didn't think they made sense. So I think they make sense. I added my photo, added my stories, mm -hmm. but it's just one more example of AI. Um, Technological pro progress will never be as slow as today. Is it slow? No, it is not slow. It's fast, but it's going to be even faster. <laughs> so this makes me optimistic. Who leads the IT reform in your company, in your customs administration, your port? COVID-19. Now we had saw a lot of progress. And when the, the pandemic started, we quite quickly put out what we call it a 10 point action plan from the ship to the port, leaving the port transit and so on. A lot of things have to do with digital solution. One key message here uh, is that, and, and especially you, the, the ones with customs background, be warned when somebody from the World Customs Organization or the WTO shows you a PowerPoint with a balance and tells you there's a trade off between um, between trade facilitation and our role to check and control and ensure compliance, tell them it's the wrong picture. Tell them Jan Hoffmann from Anktat said it's false. There's nothing 
nothing in the WTO TFA. There's nothing in the WCO in UNC fact in UNCTAD recommendations that says you should not control. But all the measures, every one of them, from risk management to pre-arrival processing to collaboration at the borders, I mean, they all help achieve both. And this is something very important, especially during these COVID things that, that we realized that we had increased demand for our solutions, Asicuda, customs automation, and so on, because people realized I want to control, but I need, I don't want to touch other people, yeah, <laughs> in paper. So the negotiation, the ratification, implementation of convention takes time. We need to commit to whatever is the best future technological solution. So in the TFA, you have something that says you should, uh, customs should accept copies instead of originals. I don't know what is the copy or the original if you have data online. No. So some people have their favorite football team, music group, or, or artist. I have my favorite article of the TFA. I am a fan of Article 10.1 <laughs> because it will still be valid in 100 years from now. Many of the other articles, you, you tick them off. Yes, I have advanced ruling. Yes, I have pre-arrival processing. Yes, I have a single window. But still in 100 years from now, you will have to continue to review, to minimize, to reduce, to always choose the least trade restrictive measure. My favorite article. And with this optimistic note, let me go one step back to the energy transition. Climate change. Who is paying today for climate change? It's those who are flooded, those who have hurricanes, those whose crops fail, those who are disappearing, and in Switzerland, those who have no snow anymore. <laughs> who should pay? The polluter should pay. And that's basic economics of public goods and externalities. Uh, you make the private sector, the, the economic actor, choose. You go slower, use clean fuel, near source, or you clean up, help adapt, or you compensate. I'm not prescribing a specific solution, yeah? as long as I make you pay. And neither, we had two weeks when we launched the IMT, there were people in London who said, why do we want all this trade? You do not need strawberries in winter. And I agree, you don't need strawberries in winter. But I'm not the one to tell you what to buy and when to buy as long as you pay for the negative externalities. So there come the so-called market-based measure. Now it's more called economic measure. So at the International Maritime Organization, there is negotiation, and I'm optimistic it will arrive, something called polluter pays or a levy on fuel or a contribution based on CO2 emissions. And I have to highlight this very proud 12 April 1995, IMO published this document, which was produced by a, at that time, younger and slimmer, no gray hair, Jan Hoffmann, who was a junior enthusiastic staff in the IMO, who was the only economist at the IMO at that time, and who thought, why not internalize externalities? So I'm still, I'm not claiming that this is thanks to me that it is now happening, but I am proud to say, this is, to my knowledge, the first IMO document that introduces this concept. A levy on CO2. Uh, on the national level, you can have it. You pay tax on your fuel. You, you get your fuel in the German uh, BP or Shell, whatever. But So here in shipping, you now have the registries, you have shippers, you have ship owners. They all understand what I just preached to you before. It's good to have an economic measure. <laughs> Um, and for us, important, it is also smaller and poorer countries. There's a long list. I don't know whether you can see the small print on the top, bottom right. You will have the whole file, of course, where you share the PowerPoint with you. So for us, at Ankta, it was important that also least developed and small countries have understood they are now, many of them, in favor of a greenhouse gas levy. And what, what are we actually talking about? What money? What, I mean... I looked how many tons of fuel are actually burned by the ships of this world. Then one ton of fuel produces 3.15 tons of CO2. Think CO2. One C 
is combined with two O's, oxygens, which have approximately the same weight, and the combination is three times as heavy. <laughs> so if you have a, a ton, a, a levy per ton of fuel, if you have $100 per ton of CO2, you actually have $300 per ton of, uh, is it that way? Yeah, I think so. Like, what is... Uh, so this, you calculate this, this, um, yeah, so we are talking about a potential levy of $72 billion dollars per year. It's a lot of money. <laughs> um, and I repeat, technological progress will never be as slow as today. I'm optimistic that it will work. Uh, and now stepping back, the challenges, opportunities why this is important and why delaying this is more costly than than the transition itself. Bear with me, the economist with his demand and supply curves. What happens if I have a levy? In, what happens to my drawing if I introduce a levy on fuel? Think yourself. What happens to the lines? Any thought? How how would I change my lines if I have a levy on fuel? Any thoughts? I'm looking at you. <laughs> well, <laughs> somehow shipping becomes slightly more expensive. The supply curve goes up. Yeah, Volumes will go down very little because of the steep demand curve, but that's the shipping becomes a little more expensive. What happens if I have uncertainty, what happens if, uh, I forgot who, uh, I think it was um, Mike. No, you had asked a question about the, the risk. If you have more risk, this is what happens. This is what I tried to answer in my answer to your question, Mike. Um, and we are really, really worried that right now we have the low order book. Ships are getting older. I go to many shipping conferences and I see investors are waiting. They they don't know what to, what, yeah. What will be the future fuel? Will there be a levy or not? What will be the IMO regulation? So they are waiting and this is more costly. So there are delegates at the IMO who are putting the brakes, who want to delay the transition. And I am sincerely convinced they are hurting themselves because this delay will increase their costs even more. In conclusion, three opportunities for developing countries. They can actually become providers of alternative fuels. Uh, I had this uh, a month ago in, in Morocco or in Chile or Sri Lanka or so, even Saudi Arabia. Uh, they can become providers of alternative fuels, power to X. Number two, with a levy, you can generate money that can be invested in the developing countries in infrastructure, in trade facilitation, in scholarships to the university in Münster to train people in customs and trade facilitation, <laughs> in shipping connectivity, uh, and and without going into the econometrics here, but you can actually quantify and show how this investment leads to lower trade costs. So on the one hand, we have higher trade costs because of a levy and alternative fuels that are more expensive. But if we invest it right, we can compensate most of this, if not all of it, through improved transport and trade facilitation. And last but not least, really here's preaching to the shipping industry. You see, in almost in, in any other industry, you can give a special deal to the Burundis and, and Burkina Fasos of this world. You can say, if you have a cement factory in Bujumbura or in Ouagadougou, okay, I give you more time. You do not need to decarbonize the next 10 years. You can do it in 20 years. Because it was not your fault in the first place. You are not the one who led to the high CO2 levels in the atmosphere. Um, you are only a small contributor at present, and for you it's much more expensive and more difficult. So I give you more time. You cannot do this in shipping. You cannot say, oh, Liberia, you're a very poor country. The ships with the flag of Liberia are exempted. No, you can't do this because the ships 
are everywhere connecting countries with the Filipino seafarer on a Korean built ship owned by a Greek, operated by a Danish. I mean, doesn't work connecting many ports. But the beauty is you have the International Maritime Organization um, and you can have one global multilateral framework for everybody, but other industries do not have. And you can do it with an economic measure because you cannot exempt poorer and smaller countries. You cannot say, okay, you are Cook Islands, you can delay your transition. It's just not possible. So how can we make the Cook Islands and the Comoros and the Mozambiques of this world agree through an economic measure that generates funds that helps them with this transition? So that is a key message out of the review of my time transport. I'm quite happy that this is now sort of official. My secretary general, this institutional report, they have this as a message. We need a green and just transition. Uh, it's a teamwork, lots of co-authors, peer reviewers. I put this here, thanking all those. And if you have uh, one more info, you can download it. You have download statistics, you can write to the whole team, you can write to me, and I will stop here and realize I have spoken a little longer than I thought, but uh, I hope you still found it interesting. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hoffmann, for this very comprehensive talk. It's really interesting for all of us to gain some uh, substantive insight about maritime transport because it's the basic for customs and the trade business. And it's a great pleasure for all of us to hear you speak today because I think hardly nobody is more capable to give us all these insights into this very, very, very interesting business. And the AE, I think, doesn't know all your efforts. <laughs> but uh, maybe, students, you can create your own lectures. We do not need guest lectures and so on. And you can stay sitting at home and do everything. Right. right. Uh, the next homework you get from Pr uh, Professor Altemöller, then you're, uh, you just use ChatGPT and don't tell him. <laughs> That's a big issue. No, it um, is. It is. It I, 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 I put uh, the last question of the housework of the uh, essay question into chat GPT and I received a perfect answer, a perfect answer. So for us, the challenge is how to create all these houseworks and essay questions in order to conduct uh, reasonable exams. So that's a big challenge. Uh, Jan, do we have... One or the other minute for very. Yeah, for, I'm fine. I'm. Discussion. I'm at okay. home. My wife is in the gym. I have permission to stay longer. At, uh, okay, so she knows that you are in good company and yes. nothing uh, <laughs> stupid things would happen. <laughs> okay. No, no. I, I'm all yours. Just I'm sorry because we had initially said sixty minutes for the students. It's also Saturday morning for you. But if you want to stay on five, ten, fifteen minutes, whatever. I'm. I'm yours. Yes, uh, Jan, there is so much talk about the reorganization of supply chains because of geopolitical constraints. I think that the supply chains have been organized before all this came up uh, in a very effective manner. But now it's a big challenge for the companies, for the regions, for the states and so on. Um, sometimes I think there is much talk about it, but do you feel or is there some evidence from your organization that the supply chain are really reorganized? Is there really a shift uh, of de-risking? Can you uh, observe this or is it still a pie in the sky? Mm. Um, yeah, this is it near shoring. Then some people talk about French shoring. We don't like these terms too much and when you look at the pure data uh, actually distances are going up you know what we do see um, already for for some time is part of this resilient supply chains is diversification you do not want to depend on only a small number of suppliers suppliers of goods of components or of shipping services you no know? so i think this is uh, uh, and i think we just lost Lost Mike. He had raised his hand and now he's gone. Well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Still here, but uh, I, I, of course, I didn't want to intrude. On ah, there. Ah, yeah, you had raised your hand. I saw you on the left. Now you're there. Okay, sorry, sorry. But but anyhow, so in terms of data, 
we do not see as much of this um, um, near foreign French foreign as we have read about it. <laughs> yeah, there's all this talk about it, as you rightly said, uh, but it's not. Um, yeah, it's not that visible. We we do see, and the, also uh, China, like is then purchasing more from Vietnam and so on. But uh, I think in the end, it will remain an economic choice. Let, let me about this. So it used to be said, uh, instead of just in time, let's work on just in case. And that's supposed to sound funny and, uh, and is meant to say, I need bigger stocks, more inventory holding. Um, you go to the penny market and, and buy your toothpaste. You buy the cheapest one within the brand or market. Now, um, would you buy, would you pay more for it knowing that penny market has a bigger stock of the toothpaste somewhere stored to improve its resilience? No. <laughs> I mean, so so the, this uh, more inventory holding has a cost which nobody is willing to pay for. I mean, you go to the supermarket and you, you may store another toothpaste at your home, maybe, <laughs> but you're not going to pay more for your toothpaste because penny market has a bigger stock. You know? mm -hmm. So that's for me a very simplified possible part of the explanation why we may not see as much of this yeah, more inventory holding and more resilience than people might have expected. Uh -huh. Thank you, Jan. Uh, any other questions? Maybe one or two questions. From there was one in the story. chat. It's one of the reasons why Asia is going up the uh, the regional agreement. Uh, Luca, you want to explain this? And then Correct. Mike will give his uh, I can't really remember that uh, <laughs> specific graphic, but it was about transport. Um, I, I think it was about the, the swiftness uh, with which the, the Asian courts uh, were able to operate. Mm. Yeah. 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 Uh, Asian ports uh, tend to be really <laughs> particularly efficient um, because they tend to be in places also where land is very expensive. So you stuck up higher, and so the KPI, if you just do moves per key length or per yard or whatever, if the land is very expensive, then yeah, you are forced to be more productive, and they have more transshipment. And transshipment simply requires less operations in the port. You no, know? for me this is. The basic reason, not so much about regional agreements or type of trade. I think these are port economics. Okay, thank you. Mike. Mike. Yeah, I just want, wanted to share share one observation and then, then also ask a question. I think uh, from what you shared with us this morning on, on, on the maritime uh, uh, trade, uh, um, at least from, from my own experience and observation, we can, can almost identical or see identical movements on the air cargo market. Um, so um, a, a lot of the, the digi digitalization, decarbonization uh, is really interesting to hear from a, from a different perspective, or, although very related. And then the question probably that I had uh, in regards to AI on the topic of blockchain, because blockchain, of course, for customs and customs regulation yields uh, some promises. Is that something uh, something that in the technicality of the, the, the customs processes in ports uh, is already being discussed? Or, or is there some, some resistance from, well, the participants, or probably the nicest way to fr phrase it, uh, that might not yet see how, how blockchain could be adopted mm. for a number of reasons. Um, yeah, your specific question about is this being looked at? In fact, our Asikuda colleagues, this customs automation program of Anktat, they um, had established a, a working relationship with TradeLens before TradeLens was all of a sudden discontinued. <laughs> um, and um yeah i see the logic in it we we have um i i will send some links afterwards to 
Professor Alte Möller, which he can share together with the file. Also, I will send you the file and some links. We have a recent study on blockchain and, and trade done by, by colleagues. So I, I make a note and send you also the, the blockchain study. I, I think the logic is there. It makes a lot of sense. The whole distributed ledger, the ensuring that an import declaration coincides with export declaration. Many of these things can can be facilitated by these type of solutions. And uh, another, you didn't ask it, but I think it's related in a way, the whole push towards e-solutions, the e-bill of lading. Uh, all, finally, it's coming. <laughs> and as you have heard, I'm I'm in this business now for, for 30 years. And from early, early on, where they always heard, why do we still need this paper? Can we not have it electronic? And there were um, um, Bolero, there were all types of, of programs and they never took off. So here in Geneva, you have the biggest container shipping, the biggest shipping company in the world, MSC. <laughs> At a recent conference, an in-person conference here, uh, Andre Simha from MSC made an excellent presentation about digital resolution, eBay of lading, and I asked him, it was a sincere question, whether this would have happened without COVID. And he clearly said, no, without COVID, we would not have the eBay of lading. So for me, it's a good example that the this was an eye opener. And even though we luckily no longer have COVID, we like to say we have to lock in the progress made during lockdown. So the advantages have been seen. It is good for resilience. So what you are doing, what you are studying customs is part of the solutions. And although blockchain may not have taken off as fast as some people had forecasted, um, I it, it may also, I, I still see future in it. Thank you very much. Jan, our time is running. Yeah. Thank I you think. so much for your insights. I think there is uh, hardly uh, a person who can uh, speak to us so colorful and who can demonstrate all these interesting developments in such a very, very informative manner. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you for taking your time. It was a great pleasure for all of us. We appreciate very much that you yeah. were coming to us this morning here. Okay. Thank you all uh, very much. Any things uh, I forgot to answer or other questions, I'm happy to connect on, on LinkedIn or I will send you some links. So I do respond to email. So good luck to you. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, you are in the right business. As you see, It's it will continue to grow and a lot of interesting things happening. So <laughs> thank you all. The students we will continue with our series of guest lectures. By the way, next Saturday morning, um, Professor Dr. Abhijit Das will join us. Uh, Professor Abhijit Das um, has been head of WTO studies at Jindal University in uh, India, and he has launched for the Indian governments a lot of trade negotiations, especially in the steel sector, is very experienced with international trade, with the international trade relations with WTO. And I think um, we will gain a lot of insights from him. He will speak about the future of trade and especially uh, export controls, the increasing significance of this very important instrument. So let's first have a 30 minutes break and we will continue then uh, with a presentation given by me about uh, some fundamentals about supply chain security. Okay, see you later then.